Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. The government would like to assess, test, and characterize the products. We've got that story plus resentencing Sandusky. But first, made it out just in time, I guess, James. Japan just imported Ebola to prep for possible Olympic outbreak. This coming from LiveScience.com next summer. Tens of thousands of sports fans will enter Japan to attend the Olympic Games, but along with paraphernalia from their home countries, the tourists may be carrying lethal pathogens onto Japanese soil. To mitigate the risk of potential outbreaks, Japan imported the Ebola virus and four other deadly pathogens in September in order to prepare diagnostic tests. This, according to news reports, pathogens represent the most dangerous viruses ever allowed to enter Japan. That, according to the report in Nature. All of them are rated biosafety level 4, BSL-4. The viruses must be held in a special containment facility where researchers follow strict safety protocols. The only Japanese facility that meets these requirements, the Japan Japanese Health Ministry's National Institute of Infectious Diseases, is about 19 miles, 30 kilometers west of Tokyo. So besides Ebola, the facility now contains four other related viruses. That would be the Marburg virus, the Lassa virus, both came from South American hemorrhagic fever and, of course, the Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. So really interesting stuff here. It's kind of the biohazard breadcrumbs to follow. And this is actually someone on the tweets who James asked specifically for you and I to kind of talk about this and maybe, again, kind of spread the breadcrumbs out for other folks to continue the research. In addition to Ebola, Japan, as we just noted, imported the Marburg virus. And when you do a little research on the Marburg virus, you'll discover Comet Ping Pong's James Aliphantus's cousin, Dr. Tim Aliphantus, though they really actually look like they could be brothers. So you got Dr. Tim Aliphantus and the UK's biomedical research charity, The Wellcome Trust, who work closely, of course, with the Sanger Institute and are known for bullying and abusing their staff, and also Sanofi Pasteur have all teamed up in the past to write research papers about the Marburg virus in Africa. So there's a lot of biohazard breadcrumbs to follow. And James, if this, all of that wasn't enough, even sort of extra bits of esotericism going on right there in Japan, as Japan's Emperor Naruhito proclaims enthronement in ancient ceremony not performed in hundreds of years. James, always interesting stuff going over there in Japan. There always is, isn't there? Well, on the, uh, the note of the enthronement ceremony, I'm glad you mentioned that because I will actually be including that as part of my uh, weekend newsletter. Um, some of the images coming out of there have to be seen to be disbelieved. Um, just crazy, uh, crazy rituals that the mind boggles could exist in the modern age. Anyway, uh, but here we are yet again, once again, the Olympics and once again, the specter of some sort of great catalyzing cataclysmic event that would uh, galvanize public opinion swirling around the Olympics. And I am definitely going to have a front row seat to whatever is coming up in 2020, I guess. Uh, although I don't necessarily want that. And yes, the threat of a biohazard event or other types of events are always omnipresent, um, especially around these types of things. Then again, having said that, I did have an episode of my podcast way back in the day about the Vancouver Games and possible false flag activity there that, of course, did not come to pass. So, you know, who knows? But anyway, it's something definitely that we need to be keeping our eye on. And I hope people will follow those breadcrumbs uh, that you mentioned in the tweets there uh, about Aliphantus and possible connection to Marburg virus research and what that that might mean. Although at this point, it just does seem like a few seemingly disconnected breadcrumbs, but we'll have to see how they how they add up. Well, because of course, all crazy conspiracy theorists would all say, hey, you know, a great way to prevent outbreaks is to not bring deadly pathogens into labs that at least here in the States have been proven time and time again to whoops, let those things out of the cage as it were. James, here in a couple of months when I'm asking you, man, I don't know what to talk about on our end of the year episode. Remind me that there's a lot of biological warfare kind of things going on. So I might have to talk about that if, if, if you please. So our second story this week on New World Next Week, episode 389, turns our eyes to the skies. Army says Blink-182's Tom DeLonge may have game-changing alien tech. Hashtag not the onion. It's written by our buddy John Vibes on the mindunleashed.com. And again, of course, everything we say always mentioned and, of course, cited and sourced down in your show notes. For the past few years, Tom DeLonge, 
former guitarist and co-founder of the pop-punk band Blink-182, has been grabbing headlines with bold claims about extraterrestrial life and advanced technology. DeLong has previously claimed that his space research organization, To The Stars Academy, TTSA hereafter, was working with the United States government on projects related to the search for extraterrestrial life, as well as the development of advantage of the team. TTSA consists of many former high-ranking employees from various government agencies, which gave his claims a semblance of credibility. But in recent months, the U.S. government has been slowly coming forward to confirm certain aspects of DeLong's claims. This last week, the U.S. Army announced that they would be working with TTSA to test a high-tech material that the organization is currently in possession of. It seems that the Army has taken these claims seriously enough to look into it for themselves. It's not clear what this material is or what its technological implications are, but there are some clues. Back in July, TTSA published a press release about a number of meta-material samples they had acquired. The materials were reportedly as if the story wasn't strange enough. Once owned by the late Art Bell, who was the host of the long-running radio show, of course, Coast to Coast AM, which often covered topics of the paranormal and supernatural, of course, including UFOs and aliens. Bell never revealed the source of the material, saying that only that the person who gave them to him claimed that their grandfather was in an unspecified government agency within the U.S. military, and the materials are, of course, related to the Roswell crash. After changing hands between journalists and UFO experts, most notably Linda Bolton Howe, of course, the materials ended up in the hands of Tom DeLonge. A recent statement from the U.S. military says, quote, the government would like to assess, test, and characterize the products from TTSA at government facilities to compare the capabilities of these advancements known to known commodities, understand what facilities would be required to reproduce the advancements, and determine their applications for ground vehicle platforms. Close all that out. Last month, the U.S. government also confirms that videos of UFOs previously shared by DeLong and TTSA were actually authentic. The Army wants to verify Tom DeLong's fantastic UFO mystery material. James, uh, we'll get, I guess, stranger as this episode goes on. <laughs> Evidently, yeah. I, yeah, this is a story that uh, I really want to hear your take on because personally, I don't trust anyone or anything associated with this story, not the people who are reporting it, not the people they're reporting on, not any of the events that they're talking about. I just don't trust any of this. My big, the, I think the biggest question surrounding this story is, what is the angle here? Why are they reporting this? I mean, because this is clearly not this super secret met, meta, met, metallic substance or whatever it is that, you know, extraterrestrial substance and the, it, hey guys, it's super secret and the army's investigating it for potential uses and, you know, here's a description of what, what it is. I mean, it's just, it's such a bizarre story on every level and I'm just wondering what the propagandistic mechanism that's being employed here is and for what purpose. And I'd be interested to hear what take you have on it. I, I mean, just aside from just having someone formerly known as just being a rock star get involved in parapolitics is, is kind of interesting enough in and of itself. I guess I've been wondering, because of course, you know, we can speculate that all the different things that happened after the stunning conclusion of America's next top president in 2016, if Hillary would have made it in, it seemed like her and Podesta and the gang were all starting to push a lot more of disclosure, all appearing on all the big U.S. talk shows saying, oh, no, 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 it's not UFOs anymore. It's UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomenon. And I wonder if some of this is just still kind of part of that disclosure program coming from the Clinton News Network that was going to roll out after 2016. And they're just still kind of, this is, you know, maybe if it was, <laughs> to put it in media terms, it was a show they did a pilot for. It didn't get picked up for series, but now they're still going to release some of the stuff on DVD for folks. How's that? Very good analogy. And perhaps there's something to that. And for people who don't remember, they might want to check out my uh, podcast on how to fake an alien invasion, which I think is probably the first place that a lot of people heard about John Podesta, because I certainly did talk about him and his tweets about disclosure in uh, the lead up to Queen Hillary being anointed. So that was that was an interesting uh, a whole, there was a whole interesting series of events that were going around at that time. You're very right about that. And there's definitely a deeper agenda to the fake alien invasion uh, idea. And is this part of that? I mean, obviously there's something going on, but 
I, I, time will tell, I guess. I mean, that's, that's the place we have to throw up our hands because clearly this story should not be taken at face value. That's the only thing I can say for certain. You know, it, it seemed like it got gotten to the point and I maybe came to this with talking to our buddy Richard Grove. I wouldn't be surprised if, to, to go back to Alephantis, if the whole Pizzagate thing wasn't a, a Clinton op meant to ensnare all the crazy internet conspiracy theorists, which again, as I, as I think you, you've pointed out, you like how I've, I've said this all in my shows before, that Pizzagate is about a comet place in D.C. like Watergate is about a hotel. There are giant worldwide child kidnapping and rape rings. See the Epstein story. So there's a lot of things, yeah, all kind of swirling around, James. Sometimes we're kind of in, an, uh, in the eye of the storm and maybe can't see it. And then we get a little bit of perspective a couple of years later and go, oh, I could see what they were laying out. And that's why we try and continue to do that. Here on New World Next Week, our third and final story, as we wonder, of course, where Epstein's Mossad, Rothschild, Gal Pal, Ghislaine Maxwell might be these days. A judge has been chosen to re-sentence Penn State coach Jerry Sandusky. A new judge is in place to handle the child sexual abuse resentencing hearing for former Penn State assistant football coach Jerry Sandusky. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court, back on October 7th, issued an order appointing Judge Maureen Skerda to take over the case. The previous judge, Judge John Foradora, of Jefferson County recused himself last month. They say Foradora recused himself for reasons wholly unrelated to the Sandusky case, but that was the second judge to recuse himself. There was another judge, Judge Cleland, that recused himself from this case back in 2016 when it was, quote, alleged the judge acted unethically by participating in an off-the-record pretrial negotiation, end quote. 75-year-old Sandusky is serving a 45-count conviction, but an appeals court ruled in February that mandatory minimums had been improperly applied. So, James, there are giant, connected, child rape kidnapping rings going on. I know that's what crazy conspiracy theorists think, but if you find the stories about the Catholic priests, about the schools, about the governments, about the militaries, about all of it, it's fairly obvious. James, you remember the story about Sandusky, right? I do, but I didn't follow it closely at the time, so I don't have a lot to comment on in this case in particular, but it certainly does fit in with so many of the other stories that are swirling around right now, and I want to come back to the way you opened that by asking, where is Jelaine Max Maxwell? Where did she go to? I, I, again, the big excluded question in the wake of the Epstein suicide, quote-unquote. Um, that is a question that is not being asked by anyone in the mainstream, but I think should be being asked. But as for the Sandusky trial itself, I haven't been following it, so I can't comment on that in great detail, but it certainly does, as, as you say, it fits into the, the greater picture that is being assembled for us, that people in positions of power will abuse that power, uh, sometimes in the most horrific and disgusting ways imaginable. From Sandusky to Epstein to, of course, even folks like Dennis Hastert. So I guess we've gotten a little scarier and scarier here on these Neural Next Week episodes as we are approaching Halloween. And as we wrap up this episode 389 of Neural Next Week, a little bit of good news for folks. I've got the latest episode of Good News Next Week about vacant lots being turned into beehives, cleaning up your permanent record, and, of course, Mr. Trash Wheel. Those solutions-oriented stories on the latest episode of Good News next week, I put those out actually for Media Monarchy members first because we are independent, non-commercial, alternative media. I stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Mountain Time at MediaMonarchy.com. I would love for folks to come check it out. And, James, you know something else that we should mention right here at the end of this episode as we're sort of thanking folks and imploring folks for support? You know who's a great support to us who we've kind of meant to mention here recently? That's video editor Brock. Huge thanks to our buddy Brock, and huge thanks to everybody out there who helps keep New World Next Week going 10-plus years and counting. James? Absolutely right. Yeah, I forgot to mention. <laughs> but yes, that that intro for the 10th anniversary was put together by Brock. I think he did a great job on that. He does a great job every single week. So everyone give him a big pat on the back and yourselves a pat on the back if you are a supporter of this material. And yes, I think we all need a palate cleansing after <laughs> our three stories here today. So go check out the good news next week over at Meteor Monarchy. Uh, on that note, we'll leave it there. James, talk to you again next week. All right, buddy. Thanks. Take care.